Hello, today is um, September 9th, 2014, and I'll just read the, the, my interview aloud with Objects Reporter. And if anyone joins, I would be happy to chat a little bit, but it is intended to be brief. <clears throat> so, my interview. Uh, object reporter is just a nickname of someone also called D. He says, Mike Stenberg, PhD, is the author, is the author uh, behind two recent books, Celestial Signs and Welcome to Earth, A Guide to Aliens. In his book, Celestial Science, Dr. Stenberg introduces the alien abduction phenomenon, discusses objectives of the human ET hybridization program, our ways to help the abductees and possible involvement of the hybrids in our future. Dr. Steinberg takes the notion of contact to the next level, discussing possible scenarios of our near future, involvement of different associations of star people, peculiarities of exopolitical workings, as can be seen from channelings and reports of contactees. <coughs> He also highlights involvement of humans in this ongoing process and possible ways for individuals in participating in the formation of their future. The object reporters are going to pick Dr. Steinberg, Dr. Steinberg to pick Dr. Steinberg's brain today, delving deep into three hot topics the internet buzzwords of ufology at the moment, telepathy, hybrids, and ET contact. <clears throat> hey, Sabrina. Agent D. Max, I was impressed with the concept of your book, Welcome to Earth, A Guide to Aliens. The clever title alone is a preview of outside-the-box thinking going on here. It reminds me of Richard Dolan's book, After Disclosure, and that it is just one of the topics that must be covered in this time of unfolding contact. Max, I'm saying. Much, much of what I do is inspired by Richard Dolan. Richard and I are members of Rochester UFO Meetup, and he is my role model in many ways. I wrote my first book because of his example of applying scientific thinking to write books on the topic. While Richard was focusing on Earth, I focused on the hybridization program and four-dimensional biology. Hello, everybody. I just step for a second. You can interrupt me at any time if you like to discuss anything. Hi, Max. Hey, Prana. Thank you for joining. You can interrupt me at any time to discuss anything. I'm still reading my interview. I don't think I will finish today. In any case, uh, while Richard sources were government archives, I relied on channelers and abductees. As he was writing his After Disclosure, his book After Disclosure, Richard presents his ideas to our group and this inspired me to write my own version in a sequel called Welcome to Earth. Again, Richard wrote about what will happen on Earth on day one after disclosure. And I wrote more about what the aliens can do to make the contact better in the first weeks and months after the contact. I also cover what we as light workers can do to make the ET contact peaceful and successful. I'm really thankful to Richard and our U4 meetup for their inspiration and support. The fact that Richard Dolan was initially a writer who successfully ventured into television inspired me to go live on YouTube and create Human Colony TV YouTube channel, this channel, which brought together many like-minded light, light workers. A guide for aliens addresses two major concerns we have when dealing with ETs. The fact that they are highly telepathic and we are not. 
and the unfortunate reality that most humans have been brainwashed from birth with misconceptions and outmoded belief systems. That's the end of my first answer. Do you want to comment anything? Pran and Sabrina, hello. <coughs> All right, I will continue. But you can interrupt in any moment. Agent D asks, do you feel this is a do you feel this is a telepathy issue we humans must overcome? And do you believe this is even physically possible for Homo sapiens to catch up to our ET cousins to become as telepathic as they are given as they are, given the fact that they appear to have transhuman qualities? And my answer. I know the answer pretty well, and it would take only one line, but I do need to explain how I know what I know. And this ought to be outlined properly. There are three main sources, testing telepathy in humans experimentally, abductees and channelers, uh, abductees, contactees, and channelers, so three sources. Testing telepathy in humans experimentally, abductees, contactees, and channelers. You see, telepathy can be tested here, and this is very a very solid data. Reports from people who visited the ships are still pretty real, and channelings are sort of real, but they have the qualities of collective dream. Not everything which sounds solid in channelings manifests here down below. So things do, some things do, and something and many things don't. So some things do manifest and many things don't. It's not it's not only that we speak to other dimensional beings, it's also that our human collective mind collectively decides which of these communications to manifest down here and which to abandon. We are talking about multiple timelines and manifesting collective beliefs into our physical reality. It's quite a different mindset, like in the mindset of the movie The Matrix. Please understand, what we hear from channelers is not individual fantasies. It's our collective dream, and a portion of this, of this dream gradually manifests. So when we research these dreams, we have to keep in mind that even most stable patterns in them can change with time. This is the nature of our reality. It's malleable, fluid these days. Yet we learn much from speaking to, with four-dimensional beings via channelers and some messages and explanations from up there make a lot of sense. Any comments so far? All right, so let's start from the, from the most reliable data, human studies. <clears throat> most expect telepathy to be uniform or, ah, would you expect telepathy to be uniform or having many various forms and flavors? Rupert Sheldrake and Dean Radin are two of the best researchers and enlightened scientific writers on this subject. Check out their books on Amazon. They are under $20 and give a great idea of the research on the topic. As Sheldrake noted, one of the best examples of telepathy are pets who read our minds. He came up with wonderful, scientifically solid study, designed, study designs to measure this kind of telepathy. Another sort of telepathy is between humans. Imagine yourself helping, uh, imagine yourself being a telepath. How would you communicate best? By reading someone's mind? How deep would you get into the mind? Would, you be, would it be every thought or only the thoughts intentionally sent to you? What would facilitate the receiving of the thoughts? Do you need to be close to the person? or distance doesn't matter? Do you need to look at their eyes? Do they need to look you straight in the eye? Would it help if you placed your hands on their head? 
Would it help to know the person? Would it be working only for very close people? Do the two people have to speak the same language? Would it be a text transmission, a text, or an image, or an idea beyond language, or an intent, or an emotion? Would it be any thought or only the thought which is important for both of you? Is using of telepathy for selfish reasons permitted by nature? <coughs> I often meet telepaths and often and offer them a test. I take a plain card, a small object like this, or a picture, look at it like that. What do I have in it? Hmm. What do I have in my hand? Right. Look at it. Where am I? And ask them what I'm seeing. And I'm sending you a telepathic message. What is that? Now I'm testing you. What is what is that in my hand? All right. Here's the answer. Then, did you guess it right? Yes. All right. So when the uh, and ask them to guess what I'm seeing. We then trade roles. You see, since the information transferred is not important, and since we don't know each other well. All right, here is another test. What's in my head? Are you telepathic? I'm looking at it. It's important for me. I like it. What is that? One, two, three, four, five. Do you it's have a, a guess? What's a pen? A pen? Yeah. No. Something Anymore? metal. Something what? Metal. Yes. I mean, when I picked it up, there was a sound, so you might well, guess. I didn't, I didn't hear the sound. Sorry. All right. So what is this? It's a forcep. <laughs> All right. Uh, I actually oh. had a forcep in front of me, so... Oh. But but this one was a okay. I was close. <laughs> All right, let me grab something else. It was fun. Mm. Here, is something. here is something else. It is very unusual thing to see here, but it just happened to be here. What could it be? What color? What material? What is the shape? It's red or green. I see two colors. I don't know why. Oh, right. wait. Actually, you know what? Hold on. You should hold it like right next to your... Uh, um, your sunglasses. Someone might see it in your glasses, reflecting on your glasses. Oh, all right. Whatever. <laughs> okay. All right. So it's, it's made of plastic. Uh, Shape? I don't confirm or right. otherwise. Just tell me what is the shape. Uh, the shape is little. It's not round. It's a little elongated. It's a little. I don't know. Is it filled inside or empty inside? Empty. All right. So it's a rubber band. It's for girls to put. Uh... Yeah. See. Okay. <laughs> so it's rubber. Oh, it was okay. It's empty inside. <laughs> Max, did yeah. you have that? Did you have the rubber band like kind of twisted in the middle? It wasn't. It wasn't. No. Okay. Because the way what I saw, what I saw in my in my mind's eye was kind of like an hourglass. Um, but that it, it looked it looked kind of like an hourglass shape. It was to me yeah to me it was it was it wasn't necessarily a circle but it was looking an hourglass in it I have another object I don't judge you just you know it's an exercise for yourself I don't judge you so what's in my hand it's something uh, I I like something I like okay and I, I often I use I see either penny a nickel or a paper clip again it's metal any more ideas? And I'm just going with my intuition right away. Like I'm not waiting, trying to focus in. 
All right. Any more ideas? I feel metal. What color? Metal? All right. All right, I'll show you. It's a candle. Ah, a candle. It doesn't focus by some reason. It should focus. Well, it wouldn't focus like that. Yeah, it's a candle. All right. So let's just. Uh, do you have any more comments? When uh, so I continue reading, and at the end of the paragraph, I will ask for comments. So and ask them to guess what I'm seeing. We then trade roles. You see, <coughs> since the information transfer is not important, and since we don't know each other well. The success rate is low. The results are barely above random. Barely above random. It's not random, but barely above. Sheldrake and Ryden review many well-designed studies and demonstrate that there are some people and pairs of people that have telepathic connection. But our telepathy, although it can be measured, it's very tiny. The telepathy is tiny. In a sense, by design, at this stage, we are permitted to see miracles, but they are rationed, limited. And here is another thought about the nature of reality. Is it really that you read the mind, or maybe you read the future? Telepathy versus clairvoyance. Maybe it's not that you receive the communication from another person about the card, but you receive a glimpse a few seconds into the future when a card is revealed. And another possibility, or maybe you change the future to show you the card you want. There are all interesting properties of the matrix we live in. Dean Radin and Lynn McTaggart explain it all pretty well. So in brief, the conclusion from the studies uh, is that some humans down here can read minds and speak telepathically, but barely. I invite comments here. Um, I had had gotten a game for my for my phone, and uh -huh. you know that you it has the little cards, and you're supposed to guess which one it is. I have the two, maybe the same one or different. It is. I have the one by Russian, someone Russian. Okay, but the interesting thing is when I'm guessing, I don't do as well as if I pick a card, and then I'm telling it. So it shows very often. So I can make that card show up more often that I can guess which card it is. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Same thing I'm telling, yes. Somehow people can affect random events. It is um, a very well-studied phenomenon, yes. You know, I think in that case what's happening is uh, you have a set to pick from. So you already know, you already know what you have. So that's why when you when you pick the answer, then the answer comes. Whereas this random guessing is something that you have no idea of. No, like but it's you, not. It's not enough. It's not enough. I I say I can change it when I get more than seven of the same one. You so see, you can you affect get, what comes out. Yeah, because it's limited to how many times you can do it. You know, like mm -hmm. one game. I don't know. I don't know if it has ten or twelve. And and then out of the twelve chances, I get at least seven of them with the same card. Out of how many cards? And there's only there's like four or five cards. Four four or five cards, I think it is. Oh, so out of four. The other way. So there's only four or five different cards. So of course the probability is very high in that. No, because it, when you're doing it guessing, uh, it doesn't show up as 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 many times as that. No, this is this is algorithmically very. This is algorithmically or mathematically, of course, like, you know, the, the chances of them coming, same answer for one out of four, you know, out of 12 chances is, is a lot higher. Whereas in guessing, 
you have no idea of what Max is holding. It could be any shape, color, metal, material, sh you know, all that stuff. So there's a, it's a very different example, I think. Do you do you see what I'm saying? When you when you have the cards, it the same card doesn't show up when you are when you are just playing playing the game. The same sharp card doesn't show up more than two or three times. When I choose to influence it, it shows up, you know, I can make it show up a lot of times. That's what I'm saying. That's all. Yeah. And that's only out of four cards, right? So, uh, pardon me, Sabrina. I definitely can relate to your idea and resonate with it because since I live over um, near Reno, you know, it's, there's gambling. I've never been, you know, <clears throat> into the whole gambling thing. However, with blackjack, it's it's really in intuitive based. And what I do is I I walk around the casinos and I just kind of feel for the energy of the table, you know. And then if it feels really good vibes, high vibration, I'll sit down and I'll just kind of just start talking to the people and just connecting. And the more I'm able to connect with them and the and the flow, oh, I had probably out of like 10, 12 times that I. I only go in with money to when I win the money and then I just that away and then I playing with and I win you know I have 120 I tuck 60 away and I keep playing with the winnings and then every 20 to 30 I'll just keep on tucking and the, I've noticed that the more I'm connected with the people at the table the more fun we're having um, the more we're able to as you say influence the cards if you will. And it's, it, it just makes it a lot more fun, you know. It doesn't, you don't have to be a card counter or whatnot. If you're having fun, you're in the moment, and you aren't. <clears throat> and and the thing I do also is, if if I could take the hit, so to speak, take the bad card or bad cards, so the rest of the table can win, then I'm all for it, you know. And that's actually um, assisting me in in the game because people have offered me money to stay in just because they felt that I was the good luck charm, you know. So it, it, it's led to a lot of fun nights, you know. It's just going there and starting at like 7 at night and not leaving until 7 in the morning and like $300 in my pocket when I started at like 40, you know. But I definitely resonate with your idea and that fact. And we definitely have influence. The more we're in the moment and really high vibration, we really can... All right, guys. What do we all need in here? What do we all need? Are we need a we need a face card? Or she need the face card? You know, and it it just makes it so much more fun. Thank you for confirming that idea for me because it uh, it just solidifies, and I've really been wanting to go and experiment with uh, with this again lately. However, I need a little bit of money to do that, <laughs> so I'm. Uh, I'm putting that out there for the universe, and it's happening, I feel. It's happening in this moment, so it'll be fun. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to answer to Prana that I believe that Sabrina didn't pick from only four cards. I think she picked from uh, multiple cards. Yeah, I was right? asking that question because I wasn't aware. I'm not aware of that game, and I thought she just said four cards, so I was just asking for the confirmation. Sabrina, if you can send Prana your uh, the name of your program on the phone, then he can figure it out. But uh, I agree that there are ways to affect their the the outcome, and th this has been studied. It's uh, the scientific research has been studied. You know, have been done in many ways. Most of that, not surprisingly, has been done in England. But uh, most famous is the one which started in Harvard. And there they uh, started trying to prove that it doesn't exist, but they discovered that there is an effect of personality on what comes out. And usually the effect is small. It's like 1%. Say, if you flip a coin, uh, on average you would get 50%. Uh, 
so and and it is a very tedious process to flip coin and write down the results. So they created a device which was electronic and it it flipped a coin electronically, and the device was calibrated to produce exactly fifty percent outcome. And then that was uh, when um, basically the person was just uh, pressing the button every time and trying to affect this fifty percent to raise it higher. Uh, so you get like uh, heads more frequently than tails, and usually people were able to shift it to 51 percent. And because flipping is very automatic, it can be done at high frequency. It can be done very. St it, the result is very statistically. It's possible to calculate the statistic statistical significance, and the significance was real. So this extra one percent was significant, according to statistics. Some people very talented could f uh, move it to about 54 percent, and if it was two people who are very well aligned to each other and who have emotional connection, like people who are in love and or people who are close family or very close friends, they could move it about 57 percent, and it was really well documented. So when two people move, it's about 57 percent. So at some point, creator of this. Um, study was traveling around the globe and trying to measure the effects of groups of people on the outcome. And the result was basically how coherent the results. It doesn't really matter if it is heads more frequent or tails more frequent, but it is something very improbable that happens, something very coherent, not random. So his best result was at certain event in Germany, I think it was somewhere in Europe, I think it was uh, lovers of Wagner or a, a composer like that. I think it was Wagner, and this event took place for about a week, where passions uh, music was played and passions of the listeners were on a very high level for about a week. So, in the in the end of the event, when the passions and coherence of that group was so high, then they got extra. I don't remember the number, but extra extreme number of percent. So just being there with this device would allow him to measure that stochasticity, randomness, and chance was decreased in a group of people which are very synchronously tuned to each other. And they studied, start, studied it on global level, and here is the site, Global Coherence Initiative, where they... So this graph actually is not coherence of random events, it is electromagnetic uh, distribution of vibrations of Earth, measurable. And you can see the, the classical most frequent one, the, this lower band. If you can see my mouse? Yeah, you can see my mouse. The first lower band is 7.5 hertz. It's like That is uh, the main harmonic of, of vibration electromagnetic field, which basically resonates between the this ground and stratosphere again goes up and down reflecting. So that's 7.5 hertz, more or less. I might, the frequency is, per, I know the frequency, the way it is generated, I'm not sure. Could it be uh, something like their penetration between two different sides of the earth? But, but you get that frequency. And then there's a harmonics of that double, that triple, that quadruple, and so on. And on different days, you can see these frequencies uh, have different maxima. It can shift up and down. The vibration can go up and down. And they measure, they place these devices all around the globe in different cities. And they measure their coherence in different places around the globe. And they see the spikes when, uh, when events happen, like um, uh, September 11th uh, attack w caused the coher um, coherence in response. Like after the attack, there was a coherence in, in the peop in the way people thought. And during certain political events, people start thinking in a more coherent manner. So they measure that, and they see a lot of correlation between different things, like what events happen, uh, spots on the sun, and things of that sort. Any comments here? All right. Just listening, Max. 
Uh huh. I will stop that demonstration just a second. Yeah, but I understand. I have read those before. Uh huh. I think Dean Radin reviews this, reviews it, and there are a few uh, Shell Drake and a few others who review that. How do we cancel it? I need to cancel my. Oh, all right. You I see think me. That's why you know nowadays some of uh, this um, light workers are asking people to meditate. Yeah. All at once at a certain point, so that you know that vibration becomes much higher, and the yes. effect. And there is an importance of holidays where uh, the whole community is uh, doing similar things and thinks about similar things and pronounces similar prayers and they kind of synchronize in common common thought pattern. So holidays, uh, religious holidays, and things like that. All right. So yeah, next, on that note, the way you know, like I mean, how Vatican in in Vatican they have like these masses and gatherings and stuff, mm -hmm. but their purpose of that gathering is completely different. It is more for uh, energy harvesting, so they have different agendas, you know. So that's what I have heard. Or like in uh, in. Um, the mosque that uh, the Muslims go to—I forgot that place. The the square, you know, the black square in uh, God, I forgot that's the name of that place. Mecca. Mecca. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> I guess um, you know it is. It's a, it defies the the society. I cannot say that it is useless. I I would say that uh, something has to be there. If um, people don't have a unity, then um, it has to be invented. Another way, the thing is that the society and the earth is evolving, so we need now new ways of which would better correspond to the current state and current goals of the of the species. So on one hand, we want to unify; on the other hand, we want to keep the diversity. So. Uh, Unification is important, but you know, in the, the way how it is done and what is hidden, it is also very important. Right. The for intention example, behind is what is important. For example, I was, I'm very, you know, many people don't feel happy about schedules and timing and being late and certain time for work, certain time for rest, and certain time for Saturday, certain times for Sunday. So I always wondered if Sunday and seven day week is something natural or artificial. I would say that's artificial. Yeah, I didn't find anything in nature which would be seven day period. Exactly. There is a period of moon which is 28.5 days. It's not exactly seven days, but it is. So it's also four weeks make about moon cycle, but it is not linked. So moon calendar is very natural, and full moons, new moons really affect the people. But the week is sort of shifted a little bit, so it's it's never the full moon is sort of never fixed to a specific day of the week. So moon calendar would be, I guess, most natural for humans, but seven day week is something. Artificial. I asked the aliens, and the answer that is, it is either human-made or alien-made, but it is not accepted anyway anywhere outside of Earth. There is no other civilizations which would do have a seven-day week. Right. My idea is like if there's a job to finish, as long as the job is finished, that's what it matters. It's not about you know it has to be certain days that needs to be worked on. On the other hand, I respect, I respect Jewish tradition of um, keeping Shabbat. It's like once a week you remind yourself and teach your family, teach your kids that this day is devoted to God. And that feels very nice, but on the other hand, why do, don't you devote every day to God? Exactly. And every hour that's, to God? that's what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. You know, if the God is within you, that means you have that God, and so just remind yourself of every single moment, like whenever you have little time, you know, why do you need a certain time? You don't. That's all cultured. On the other hand, I wouldn't say that uh, 
the fact that the cities need to synchronize and there should be some schedule. I agree there should be some schedule. For example, uh, like stores, the, the, you know, the stores open at certain time and close at certain time allows people to, the city to breathe. Like the stores are open, people go shopping, the stores are closed and people clean up and, and take a rest. So, so that makes some sense. But there are cities which are uh, are open all, all day and night, like New York City or Moscow. Right, yeah, yeah, that's that's the point also. Like, it makes sense only if you are fitting to that timeline. But, you know, if there's the store is always open and there's always somebody there 24-7, then, you know, like, people can come in 24-7, right? Yeah, I think it's, in, yeah, with Internet, um, it makes a lot of sense that people right. don't have to be bound. I really love that ability to... Uh, Follow your own biological clock and not to be bound by absolutely uh, artificial I ones. Yeah. All right. I will move with the questions. <clears throat> Agent D asks: We have many cases in which human abductees have reported having strong purely telepathic communications with ETs aboard UFOs and outside of UFOs, but in their presence. And this is this possible? Is this a possible indication that humans have hidden telepathic abilities after all, as you have su just suggested? Or could it simply be assistance via unseen technical means used by the visitors? <clears throat> I answered. Contactees and abductees tell much about telepathy out there. The aliens can speak telepathically. Some of them look very human. Sometimes they put the thoughts into you when you don't see them, and sometimes you have to see their faces to understand what they speak. Sometimes they speak your language, and sometimes they put thoughts into you which are beyond language. It really helps telepathy to be on the ships, most likely because you get into a somewhat higher dimension, which is more conductive to telepathy. Communication with the aliens up there helps to retain some of the telepathic talent when coming back to the ground. These are all facts from personal experiences, not channeled. I have hosted an abductee support group for a few years, and I have learned that much firsthand. Some of these interviews I published on YouTube, period. Um, any, hey, Brian, any comments here or questions? My understanding or, or what resonates with me is that, yes, we are all telepathic, we have all that telekinesis power, um, and it is all within us, and it's just been suppressed um, or modified. And once the so-called veil lifts or this control system goes, most probably we will be uh, connecting with that again, and we will be what we once used to be with all that powers. And all this... Uh, Electronics, like for example, iPhone, all that stuff is merely just a reflection of what we used to have at one point. You know, because right now we can send emails instantly, right? And if we have telepathy, we could already do that. We don't need some electronic gadget to do it. And just by a mental projection, we could be somewhere and we could be talking to that person or we could be watching, astrally projecting somewhere and understand everything. The interesting thing is Beatles have a song that is called, um, uh, there's a song, it says, I forgot the name of the song, something, Inner Something, but the lyrics of the song is basically like saying, knowing without actually going outside the door, you know, understanding everything without actually living where you are, um, and also, just the further you travel, the less you become connected. So I think they are talking about astral projecting yourself uh -huh. and what you can understand and learn and opening your third eye. That actually is the coded message behind that song, I think. Let me read it. Uh, I just found it. The Beatles, The Inner Light. <clears throat> yes, that's the song. Uh -huh. uh, written by and... Harrison, George Harrison. George Harrison. Without going out of my door, I can know all things 
of earth without looking out of my window. I could know the ways of heaven. The farther one travels, the less the farther one travels, the less one knows. The less one really knows without going out of your door, you can know all things on earth without looking out of your window. You could know the ways of heaven. The farther one travels, the less one knows. The less one really knows, arrive without traveling, see all without looking, do all without doing. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's basically looking within and connecting to yourself and your inner light. That means connecting to your higher self and the third eye. Sabrina, yes, please go ahead. Sorry. Max, I have hey. a question for you. Yay. Do you think that the humanity as it stands right now uh, non-hybrid, well obviously we are hybrid for a long time ago, but but non-hybrid, you know, within the last couple of, <clears throat> of you know, decades. Um, do you think we are able to have the telekinesis, you know, telepathy, all of these different abilities uh, within us, or do we need to become hybrids in order for them to become fully activated? All right. Um, I think I'm answering that question just down below, but I will answer it now and then I will repeat it by reading. So my, I don't know, of course, but I asked the aliens about that. And again, Prana, you are speaking from your own perspective which is I think you're very advanced so you really have the telepathy hidden and Sabrina and I might have this telepathy hidden and it sort of wants to come out and we have moments when we feel it we feel it you know feel information coming through now I asked about that uh, I think I asked several times I don't remember who specifically answered but I think it was Lakesh the current just do who were speaking about that and they said you know they measure our telepathic abilities related to Yale just because it's easiest so Yale are very telepathic now they say that our best telepath the ones they sort of trained in the colonies was about 70 percent of Yale and it was a lot and they didn't want to push them him farther because it would damage him. Basically, our body is not designed to go there farther than 70% of EL. It's a lot. It's just kind of amount of information that goes into you, and vibration is so high that if you come back to Earth, it's really hard to be grounded with that amount of telepathy. Uh, other telepaths which they had at the moment, it was about half a year ago, they had about 15. Um, range between 30 to whatever 50 percent of telepathy so they could pass the telepathic messages but not as well as the AL. Um and they said most of humanity is like zero to one to maybe two percent of AL. so sometimes something goes through but it's very random and very unfrequent and it's very noisy one thing we discussed, and also there is a nice book by Dvir, Adrian Dvir, uh, uh, it's called X3, and he discusses telepathy a lot there and the biology of telepathy. Basically, there are telepathic languages. So when society, when people in certain race speak telepathy, they use certain telepathic language to deliver information. So you can speak telepathically English or you can speak something else, but it has to be something that you send and that the receiver receives in the same pattern. So most of the humans, we don't have that. We don't have this uh, telepathic language developed. And they said, 
for adults it is almost impossible to reach high percentage of telepathy. Some telepathy is possible, even you know, with technological help, without technological help, say certain percent is possible, but uh, you have to be born and develop the telepathy uh, from the childhood to be fully telepathic. So the answer is in between. We are not fully incapable, we are not fully capable, we are somewhere in between and I guess it would range radically for different people. But, but Max, couldn't, couldn't you couldn't Sorry, one please. argue that... Sorry, goes first, yes. Couldn't one argue that um, let's say you taught you started practicing, you taught your children from the very beginning yes. and the next generation uh, would be even better because the the muscle, if you want to call it that, yes. is the it's muscle. Good. Yes. Yeah. So so you're using that, and and as we progress, it, we would get better and better at it. Of course. That's why they give us about two hundred years to ascend. Ascension. Their definition is essential is telepathic unification of the species. It's a necessary uh, requirement for us to raise vibration, collective vibration. We have to together knit together so the vibration becomes higher. Mm, I don't have anything vibrating around me. <coughs> Say when it's loose, the vibration is low. And even if you spin, the vibration is like slow. But when it is tight, the vibration is very high. So when it bind bound together, the vibration becomes really high. Hmm. I guess that that is a good example. That is low vibration, right? And that is high vibration. It's like on the on a string on the guitar. I will bring a guitar show. Yes, the guitar model works well. Yeah. So we get low vibration. And then we kind of shorten the links. Just because the, t the ties are closer, the distance is closer, the vibration goes higher. And from guitar we can get even higher with a um, smaller string and also if you on the guitar the highest I can get is that like, I don't know if it passes through your through the microphone but it's barely hearable it's almost it does enough. it does but it is the highest so the shorter the link so the higher the vibration is it's kind of simple physics which is even obvious mechanically so we have loose loose individuals when we tie together the links become really short and we kind of vibrate all together as new entity. Uh, Bashar uh, tells about how his civilization ascended. They, he said a being came and in three days the being united the whole civilization together telepathically and left. And that's how they ascended in three days. I didn't ask, I know. Next time you speak to Bashar, we should ask if it, or any Chakani, we should ask if it was Jesus who did that, but you know, it could be anyone. I don't know who, who it was. But do you think? Why would you think it would be Jesus? Uh, Max, it's his profession. Uh, it's his specialization uh, to to raise a uh, um, third, third to fourth dimensional uh, upgrade. That's what he does. Ah, I see. Okay, thank you for clarifying. And hi, Ravi. Uh, Sabrina, you asked the question which I kind of shifted away from the question. Uh, no. Several generations needed to train the telepathic muscle, develop telepathic language, right? Yes. Yeah, so so wouldn't we at, at some point then also become, you know, as, as the Yeyels? Yeah. It's also called social singularity. People discuss that internet connections, especially this Twitter, Facebook, email connections, they make the network much more dense, LinkedIn connections. So we are doing technologically, uh, we kind of modeling technologically what we will do the later biologically. 
like lots of people are connected to each other in computer games. It is some new way of communicating. People kind of meld together. They speak to each other vocally, type all the time. My kids all do that all the time. I think it is some new community which is also like modeling what will happen later. Uh, when I started emailing, oh, I mean my life changed. I it was 1989, around 1989. My life changed radically. You know, the life, the world from you know tiny world of people around you, or people in your city changed to the world global world. 1989 for me, it was it was a radical change. Uh, when I spoke, once I came to California, first time I came to California, all was like landed in. The next few days, I was kind of. Uh, once I was invited to a party, these were elderly people, 1993 it was, I think. Uh, they invited me like the first, you know, a fresh Russian who is not spoiled by America yet, and and um, uh, they wanted to hear from me, you know, how is life in Russia, 1993. And there was a nice gentleman who was fighting against Nazis, I think he was a line pilot or something like that. So he was, uh, so he was, uh, had a big experience, lived a long life. And he said, he asked the question, what was the biggest change in the history of humanity in, in that century? And on his opinion, the biggest positive change was television. He said, before the television, the world looked, the world looked uh, to people very distant. People could believe that these are ours and these are them. But when television sort of showed what is happening out there, actually it was around 1967 when the first true reports came from Vietnam War, uh, <clears throat> then the, the humanity just realized how the small the globe is and that uh, nothing is very distant, that you know we're all in the same globe and we're all very close to each other. So, so in his opinion it was the main thing that united humanity together. So 1967 is about the time when it was unified, the humanity, plus minus, of course. Now we have another unification through internet, but again, you know, telepathy is something, uh, yes, that is coming. But one thing that Sabrina asked was, uh, do we have to become hybrids in order to own those abilities? And I would say no to that. I would agree. I. Uh, that's what aliens, my alien friends, say. And uh, there were like examples when uh, humans. So basically, there is a lot of humans who have human genetics and who are brought up out there. Um, these include a few recent. I would say experiments. So they take human embryos and just impregnate hybrid peop people out there, hybrid women, and let them grow up. So this genetical genetic humans, when they grow up in four-dimensional realities, they are fully telepathic. There is no limitation whatsoever. They are very talented, and so genetically we don't have any limit. <coughs> We are genetically, biologically very programmable. It is the program that we receive here which restrains that. So as we grow, as we are programmed, then our telepathic abilities are not developed and blocked. So I agree with Prana in that. But, you know, if... Uh, no, I also agree with it. I just was speaking with somebody <clears throat> and uh, they were putting forward that that basically we needed to become hybrids in order to get the upgrade <laughs> you know to put That's it simple. I think those alien beings have ulterior agenda or motives behind it why would you say that just a feeling just a intuition is that based on fear or on love it doesn't have to be you can be neutral 
you can just observe and you know you can just observe two people fighting and not uh, be a part of that but you can just simply observe and watch what happens or say like you know um, it's just observation that's all all right so um, <clears throat> That's a big question. Again, I will answer it down below in the interview. But um, again, it is from each perspective you you look at it, and how much deception is there, and how much of selfishness is there. Like in one of my early books and videos, I say that you know, of course, every everyone works for for selfish reasons, even humans, even aliens. But you know how selfish it is. It's like there is a that that selfish and that selfish. For example, you know everybody wants to live in beautiful, loving world. Is it selfish to make a world beautiful and loving, right? So <clears throat> it looks like Earth is is essential for the development of the galaxy and humans in the galaxy. So they uh, selfishly want us to succeed, to succeed, and then we will help them. So it is sort of selfish, but it's not detrimental to us. Uh, others really want to take over the world. So these are basically different ways to take over the world. Some of them are very friendly and some of them are kind of deceitful. Um, as far as I can tell, um, Zeta Grays, um, so far I speak to different aliens through channelers and Zeta Grays seem to have an agenda of taking over the world negatively. So yes, they did hybridization program and they um, they did it to other races. Basically, they inject their genes and then at certain point they use these genes and these implants to take over the planet and take control and then deplete the planet of resources and uh, leave it at worse condition than it was before. On the other hand, they created new races, and one of the races I believe they created is Yael, and another race is Chakani, which or they created Sasani, which became Chakani, which are very positive and benevolent races. So not everything that Z Zeta Grays do are is negative. So some of that is negative, some of that is... So, so Max, how does that work? How does the... Because they created those races, but... How did they separate from them? That's what I could never understand. Um, and become separate from, from the Zetas. Uh, that's a nice question. I I never asked it. Uh, but I know that... I asked the question if Yael are different from Zetas, if they have common mind with Zetas, and clearly they, do, they don't. They are in different... Uh, different. So Zetas sort of created them and, or, I mean, it's a complicated, convoluted question how Yale was created. So Yale is a hybrid between Earth humans and Zetas, but there is time loops in history which make it so convoluted and I don't know the answer how it happened. But Zetas were key to creation of that, basically. They contributed their genome and they did hybridization program on Earth, so Zeta were the keys in creation of Yael. We should ask more about that. It, it was like kind of a mystery so far. So so the answer is yes, these civilizations, they separated themselves from Zetas and not serving Zetas and they're kind of neutral and I believe Yael are actually, most of Yael are in sort of Cold War state with Zetas. They have diplomatic relationships but they don't really cooperate much. <clears throat> so basically what you are saying is they are fighting with their own creators? This Cold War is not fighting. They kind of have... Uh, again, there is tons of different Zetas and there are different kinds of Yael. But the main main body of Yael and my, main body of Zetas, they are not very friendly to each other. That's what I know. Not. They're in peace, at peace, uh, Zetas in general don't fight. Zetas are sneaky, but they don't fight. So it's yeah, not a war, sense. it's more like a cold war. They sneak here and there, but they have different agendas and follow different, uh, they have very different ideas about the future of Earth. 
Uh, all that said, there are positive aliens, and we're in constant communication with them. Pleiadians, Lyrans, Yael, uh, Arcturians, and they are very respectful of our choices, and I think that's the main criterion. They respect our collective choice and individual choices. Until certain point, about until 2012, they allow themselves to do secret abductions without permission from physical mind. They could ask the soul for soul's permission, but they wouldn't ask necessarily for physical mind. Starting from about last year, I think actually we know the date, they, they don't abduct people anymore without conscious physical consent. And uh, that shows their respect for our uh, choices. And they really want us to succeed and they want to help us. One of the answers I gave in the, my uh, one of the first videos and one of the first books is that they actually are interested in us evolving so they can incarnate in us. When we evolve to uh, four-dimensional beings, then it would be for them, it would be a great experience to incarnate in us, and it's sort of decided on a very high dimensional level. It's not our physical decision, it's out there they decide. And um, right now we are not very interested for incarnations, it's kind of for them going way down from their higher vibration to low vibration. You can't really learn much going from higher vibration to lower dimension vibration. Mm, for example, you know, if you're a human, incarnating into a mosquito is not a great experience. You couldn't learn much being a mosquito. Uh, so for them, from their fourth dimension to our third dimension incarnating, it's not that big of a difference, but only few of them incarnate as humans. And mostly it's not to gain personal vibrational lesson, but it's to help uh, the humanity to ascend. So I believe they are beneficial, uh, benevolent, and their hybridization program is for the good of humanity. Um, <clears throat> they, you know, bring in their genes, Yael, Pleiadian, Liran, a little bit of Arcturian, um, increases diversity on Earth. It doesn't serve, um, it doesn't help them to I know it helps them a little bit to incarnate, but not much. But it brings uh, more of talents, again, telepathic and telekinetic and similar talents to us, more psychic talents. So yes, we have that, but bringing more of Yael and Pleiadian brings more of this talent to us. Max, uh, may I ask a question? Yes. Have you ever heard of the harmonic conversions? Harmonic conversions. Is I will draw it for you. It was a major topic of 2012. So what it is, there is one. Can you can you see? Well, there is one wave, right? It could be a wave, right? And there is another wave. And the key for this way convergence is that at some point they come in the same spot. And just to draw it easier, I would, I would draw it backwards. I would draw lots of things backwards. So these are different timelines, different lives. Uh -huh. but at some point, they all come, converge to one point, And then again, go separately. So the idea for 2012 was that by design of our artificial reality, of our experiment, we are allowed to take any steps between here, so we have lots of free choices. But by some miracle, at that point we would end to a very limited number of scenarios. And number of these scenarios, of, these are kind of blobs, but number of these scenarios, according to David Wilcock, was two. One is good and one is bad. So there were two convergences. And um, luckily we ended you and I, and you know, you, all of you and I, we ended in a good one. The, the Earth survived. In the negative one, the Earth 
basically there was a big catastrophe there and uh, uh, possibly that led to the creation of Zeta Grace, which I'm not sure, but you know, th there was a story which kind of that catastrophe led to Zeta Grace or something of that sort. But we are not there, we are in this reality. So why are you asking? I was asking because it was talked about last night at the talk, right. the presentation. And um, one of its one of the things was mentioned, which actually parallel with you, was the fall of Soviet Russia. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this was yeah. a very this was an unpredicted. This wasn't a planned political move. This wasn't actually a, a proper um, change that happened. And that was one of the convergence points. Mm -hmm. And this is when a lot of the channeling started coming in. Some some people as well. And I just wanted to mention that. Uh huh. Because that was talked about by Lee Carroll last night. Uh huh. I have another question, Max. Yeah. yeah. For the uh, Sedas, if we, if there are parallel realities, and from what Bashar has says, every time you change something, you create a new one. Yeah. So they weren't really cr um, changing their own reality. They created another timeline where they survive by creating the Yayels and do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because their I, timeline was where it was so by them going into our timeline and doing what they did they just created a third one. Yeah. I, I don't know the details but it sounds like logical. It would be nice to hear more about that. I don't know the story. Um, Zechariah tells a nice story. He says that he was a, a high-level Zeta official in one of past lives. So whenever Zeta bothered him, he would tell them to go away and they have to follow his orders because uh, reincarnation doesn't uh, minimize his powers over Zeta. So he he still is uh, has the right to, to command them. So. So that was very funny. So Zakaria would be a nice person to ask about Zeta history. He knows a lot about it. Okay, thanks. What I heard was that now the influence is minimal because Gurkhvitnir is in control and uh, Federation of Light is in control. So Zetas are permitted to be here and observe, but all their plots sort of being um, exposed and they don't have many chances of taking over. So they're more, more like here as observers. And when we hear this high pitch sound in our heads, like uh, they, they say that is a signature Zeta, pres Zeta presence. And you have a choice. You can say, dear Zetas, please step away. I don't want your presence now. And they have to follow your desire. Okay, good to know. Yeah, it's our universe. We choose it. We choose. So. All right. I will keep reading. I I feel like closing soon, but I will read a little bit more. Maybe if I find the file. All right. <clears throat> uh, all right. Some of these interviews I published on YouTube. Yeah, I interviewed uh, an abductee. She has wonderful memory. She remembers almost everything. Because she was a volunteer, they allowed her to remember a lot, and they allow her to say a lot. Her name is Rosemary, and she is interviewed. It's published. I can give links. It's about three hours of interviews. Um, and she says that uh, she had experience when uh, aliens took to each talk to each other. When she looks at them, she understands what they say. And when she looks away, she hears the sound, but she cannot understand what they say. All right. Agent D, looking back on some of the earliest abduction accounts, there was a lot of abductees describing the large liquid black eyes of the greys being inches from their face, resulting in a strong telepathic mind melt. Since that time, I think a lot of us have associated those big black eyes of the tall greys and perhaps biologically aiding in their powerful, pow, pow, powerful telepathy. 
Decades later, when the concept of the hybrid children began to, began to grow clearer with detailed eyewitness descriptions, it seems that one common trait all hybrid children share are very large eyes. Do you feel like uh, the large eyes aid the te in telepathy and the genetics have specifically been passed on to the hybrid children to boost telepathy? <clears throat> I, I will show you that little drawing of mine. I drew it basically from uh, from just looking at many pictures of other witnesses. So it's a collective sort of collective uh, composition. I don't have it from my mind. It's more like from looking at many different YouTube videos and pictures. Okay. Now. <clears throat> Where am I? All right, Max. Yes, Ma I say yes, but it's a little more complicated than that. Here, I don't know the exact answer. At future channeling session sessions, I will surely ask my galactic friends about that. That's a great question, or many questions. Are the tall greys the same race as Yael? I assume so, but I never asked. <coughs> I know that the short grays are Zetas, but the tall ones, on this picture which I just showed, Jesus um, said that this is a typical short gray, typical, yeah, yeah, uh, sorry, typical short gray, the Zeta, I'm sorry. So the Zetas are short gray and that's the picture. But the tall one could be more than one gray species. But I do know that it's mostly a friendly species of Yael who were doing the abductions. And they look like tall greys, although they are said to have a large portion of Earth human DNA. I will comment here that I asked Tisdu recently what percentage of hybridization program was done by Yael, and he said 71%. Uh, one, could ask, one could also ask, does the size of the eyes really matter? It is important to be near, is it important to be near and look eye to eye to do the mind meld? I suppose not. I'm pretty sure the size of, of the eyes has little to do with telepathy. From my own experience with humans, it is just the opposite. The people with highest psychic abilities, which are close linked to telepathy, actually have smaller eyes. So psychics typically have smaller eyes on average and also have poor vision. It's pretty typical that a modern human, for a modern hu human to become more psychic, it really helps to disconnect from the world, see less physically, hear less physically, and then one can focus more on higher reality and see and listen more in other dimensions. I comment here that, what's your name, Vanga, Vanga, most, one of the most famous psychics, Edgar Cayce and Vanga, I guess, most famous psychics. Vanga was completely blind uh, from a uh, young age, and uh, you know, she's a, one of the best psychics, period. Also, I suspect that, and I believe that there are more messages that the big eyes of the greys were genetically engineered to help them to see in the dark. We know for sure that Earth animal, for the Earth animals it is true, the bigger the pupil, the more photons they can catch, and this helps nocturnal, nocturnal animals to survive. Octopuses and deep oceanic fish have huge eyes because they are to see the sparse light, not from the sun, but from bioluminescent creatures <clears throat> and decayed organics in the dark of the oceanic depths. So my educated guess is that big eyes of the greys and other aliens are for better vision and not for telepathy. With that said, I agree, and I know that the aliens infuse DNA of various galactic species into Earth's human population with the purpose to make us more telepathic. <coughs> this is the main help we get in our rapid evolution and it is essential for our survival as a species. Another, another closely, closely related quality which we get with the DNA upgrade is the ability to function in fourth dimensional reality. The whole Earth is shifting towards the fourth dimension. 
There are also called waves of four-dimensional energy, and these infusions of galactic DNA are a great help to our, our species. Keep in mind that the whole transition of four to four dimension is estimated to take about 200 years, starting around 2012. So we are only getting glimpses of four dimensional reality. Much more is coming. The main, the main quality of it, a stronger manifestation of the law of attraction, um, our thoughts and intentions will manifest stronger. Our focus of attention affects the reality now much stronger than it did in the past. I, I will repeat. Our focus of attention affects the reality now much stronger than it did in the past. So yes, I believe some humans would, re would receive big eyes from the alien DNA infusions, but not as a tool for telepathy, but simply as a side effects of DNA upgrades. Especially, this should affect people with the AL infusions, but also possibly with Pleiadian infusions. With that said, I cannot say from personal experience that hybrid humans on Earth have bigger eyes. Those people who I know and who b I believe are hybrids have normal eyes. By looks, I cannot even tell which hybrid species DNA do they carry. I believe the percentages of alien DNA are small and they don't manifest too strongly in general. Historically, no Northern Europeans carry more Pleiadian DNA. People from India, Middle East, and Africa more Syrian genes and Jews more of Yale DNA. But these are only slight traits. There is so much mixing together and carrying over of genes that these are only fading traces of past landings and infusions. These days, every one of us is a mix of many races. Everyone has hidden, hidden silent, dormant abilities, which can be uncovered either in this life or in lives of our children. As I said, the aliens predict that thickening of abilities would happen gradually over six, eight generations. <clears throat> I will stop reading here. I will take the questions and I will wrap up now, soon. Please, um, go ahead. Max, from what we learned and have been playing with um, are going back to the telepathy or yeah. the telepathy. We've been learning that it's from the heart. It goes through the, the heart. Often, yes. And as we've been opening our hearts more, we've been flexing that muscle, so to say, and been having a lot, a lot of success with it to the point where it's bringing in not just communication, but it's also bringing in a flow of life, a synchronistic, positive way of living, where everything's taken care of. Everything's now, oh, there's these ups and downs, don't get me wrong. But it's, uh, we've all been speaking galactic languages, we've all been communicating, and we've had this love and this passion, this excitement, and this is just helping our telepathy so much. And it's such a beautiful experience, what we're going through. And I would say much gratitude for setting up the site and bringing us together. Because um, without you and Jim, we wouldn't be here co-creating this and everyone else right now. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Talking about galactic languages, I would like to um, you know, ask this question. or it's, it's not really a question, but just a curiosity and I would like to hear you guys perspective on it I did talk to Sabrina a little bit about it you know um, now we have Tucker coming and uh, teaching us some of the Lyrian language or the words my question is why is that necessary especially when if we are improving our telepathy and telepathic skills and after the contact they will be able to speak to us directly. That means we would be able to speak to them telepathically. So there is no need for us to learn word by word or trying to make a sentence. It's not as if they're going to speak in their language and we will translate that in English to the people on Earth. 
the message will be telepathically given to us and we will just automatically be able to translate in any language whether it be English, Chinese, Japanese, American, Asian, whatever it is depending on who that message is given to or is coming through and what languages that person can speak. So I am just wondering about this idea of learning um, this language, this galactic language or specifically Lyrian language and learning word by word and sentence by sentence. What's the point? I know the answer but I would invite others to answer first and I will then second. What's the point in eating? What's the point in going out for a good meal? What's the point of doing this? What's the point of doing that? We heard no, to care, uh, speaking through no, Jim, my, my a few is, words. Prana, please let me talk. I haven't finished. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. The reason why we do communicate and the reason why we do want to know and the reason why we're humans is because we hear something new and we want to find out more about it. The curiosity may be killed the cat is the word you're looking for there. No, so I think you we understand. heard Jim talking, uh, Takir talking a language. So we wanted to know more. So we started doing it. We started opening our hearts to all these different aspects, all these different parallel realities of ourself, of our history. And now we can bring that through. And we can do it. We can understand. And yes, we, do, we could talk telepathically. But that's not fun at the moment for us. At the moment, we, we can't. But we can, have, we can show there's other languages out there and other races. And we can help the other people on this earth understand what we don't already know. Okay, so from your point, it's basically we are just having fun trying to just learn little language. That's it. We're having, yeah, we're following our excitements. Yeah, I understand yeah, that. I mean, that do. is what it is. Yeah, I understand that. I was just wondering why. That's all. I invite more answers. I know more answers. So I invite you to say more, and then I would tell more. Hey, Stephen. Oh, nice to see your face. <laughs> Hello. Have you have you have you heard what we are discussing? A little bit. I was watching live on YouTube while I was en route. And so the uh, question is, uh, why do they started? Why did they start teach us Lyrian language? It would be like the most the least useful exercise logically. It would be the least simplistically. It, it's, it seems to be the least useful exercise for us at the moment. There are more important things. Why would they teach us? Lyrian language are not anything more useful. Would you like my input, or is this just the question that's if going on? If you have a good answer, of course. Well, I uh, personally, I uh, am intrigued by the whole idea of alien languages being taught in the group and practiced in the group, just because there we don't know, we aren't understanding them. I'm not sure why you're specifically picking out Lyrian as not useful? Is oh, that because, because uh, they didn't explain us the words of other languages and they picked Liran and started giving us the meanings of different words so it's like oh, it's not the real language. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, I wasn't too. But because I they are more was... connected with the human beings. Oh. Because they have more clear DNA with the human beings. Uh -huh. And because it's very close that the language will be more most known on Earth. Thank you, Zina. You're welcome. All right, my kids are starting to misbehave. I need to wrap up. Uh, so my answer is, you know, there are many answers, but first, uh, Prana, you're saying that after the contact, things will become miraculous. Telepathy will come, and uh, they will give us a lot of. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if we like going to the colonies now, mm -hmm. if we are practicing telepathy, and you know, like the people that are speaking the language, they are getting, they are downloading the languages themselves and just starting speaking because they were not being taught word by word, right? We are just speaking the language automatically. Uh -huh. If that is the case. Why do we need to learn the language, like for example, the Lyrian, or any? It could be any other languages. But since we are learning Lyrian, I'm just taking that as an example. Why mm -hmm. are we learning that word by word when we can speak automatically 
just speaking it, you know. And I'm not saying it's not useful. I'm just wondering what was the the intention, what was the reason behind it, not the intention. All right. So because you are the first at learning, it's not appropriate, and it's going to be a very Very right, nice. but when when uh, the contact happens, we, we, the ones who are here in the human colony or learning all these languages telepathically or you know just downloading it, we would get that information telepathically, you know already. We wouldn't be connecting. Con they won't be just saying in their language, learn language something to us, and then we translate that to English. That's my point. You know, I, I was just, it's just curiosity. It's not that I am against it. You know, it's great. I'm just wondering why, because we already are learning the language, and why can't we just translate it automatically also? That was the question. It's impossible that I can give you right now the whole things that you need. There is a time that will come. You may not be here, but some will be. You need to be patient. Just wait. Sure, sure. Yes, I understand. I understand. I think this is now channeling Aliran. It's not Zina speaking. It's Aliran. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Uh, that's, all right. There's a million coming through. I, I will give uh, simple answers. Uh, first, it looks like the plan for the first con contact is very limited right now. I think they are discussing just to let know the, the humans unequivocally not questionable, very certain proof that they are around here, they exist, but not influence much more. That's I think is the maybe they will outline their intentions, but then they will let humans digest it. I think that's the plan for now. They don't want to be really taking control of the humanity or influencing it in any way. They will allow humanity to make uh, its own mind. So the chance that they will start open contact and they will flood us with telepathic information. It is possible, but it is, I don't think it is the main plan. So uh, hoping that it will happen is nice, but I, I don't think it's guaranteed. I think the chances are not very high that it will happen. It, it would be nice, of course, just to be flooded with positive information. We will see how it happens. Second, right now they are acting under very limited rules. They basically are still uh, dealing with us as with um, uh, primitive civilization. Uh, they uh, use that, how do you call it? I forgot the word. Where you are non-involvement, how do you call it? There is a principle in Star Trek, the principle of non-involvement. Basically, they don't, they're not allowed to give us yeah, Prime Directive. It's called Prime Directive in Star Trek. So basically they are allowed to give us a little bit miracles here and there to boost our interest, to boost our beliefs into a good future, to push us gently towards good direction. But it has to be our choice. They are not permitted to give us any solid proof unequivocal solid proof of their existence. So that's why they do channelings which are can, which can be very easily dismissed. And now have, luckily they give us languages which are amazing miracles. The fact that the group can speak language and they can transmit information back and forth, they speak the same language, is a miracle by itself. But it's again it can be dismissed by others because there is uh, no specific test here. You cannot say, Sabrina, I give you these numbers, say that in Liran, in Liran to this, to Zina, and Zina will translate. They refuse to do that. We try this experiment and uh, we, won't be, we, won't be, we won't give them that proof. They kind of messed up the numbers and basically the proof didn't come through. It would be nice, but it didn't happen. So, uh, this language is primarily just to uh, show us wonderful world outside and give us a glimpse and to the believers give some something more exciting. But moreover, when a person starts speaking the language which is downloaded, it is a channel for channeling. So it's kind of a little tiny 
flow, which when you speak, you kind of, they do their part, but also you do your part. When you start speaking and practicing, you develop this channel and your free will is included, basically. You show for real your commitment to channeling, as Gabriel did. He asked everyone, please, please, listen to me. I will be channeling for you. I want to speak. And finally he was given it because he was so adamant in doing that. He wanted that. Really, really, really wanted that. So this, uh, also for the aliens, it's very difficult to induce channeling in us without damaging us. That's our brain is such a mess. When we start speaking of the language, for them they can send a pattern and see that pattern physically becoming a language. And when they see this pattern in the brain, transdimensional, they send transdimensional message, but that becomes something physical which you pronounce, electric impulses, mechanical movements, they can see it transdimensionally. They can trace it within the within the conduits and activate these conduits and help us to develop this channel. So channeling becomes a real circuit, like a, a radio uh, system with certain circuits in the brain, which uh, starts communicate transdimensionally. So it takes uh, communication in both directions. It's now, awesome. they give us the words, which is hooray, that's wonderful. Finally, they give us the meanings of the words. And that gives us another opportunity to learn the language, as we Earth humans do, word by word, start speaking in it, and then it will again be used to open the true channel of communication, because it's a channel in transdimensional communication, telepathic communication with the aliens. I hope that answers all the questions of Prana. Okay, I like to make a quick statement. Yes. Like Bashar says, it's our choice how we dance down this hall. If we want to do this, we can. If we want to do that, we can. It's this and that, you know. So there's so many possibilities out there. We're, we're just creating it right here, right now, you know. Yes. I'm not too much with the wise and more with the trust I go with personally. And that's my statement. Thank you. Thank you. Zina, do you have anything to add? Asha Katira? I just heard uh, it's. Um, um, I know I'm, I'm totally connected, but it's. Um, uh, he he just said that the channeling it's more softly, softly connection than. Whatever you said. Um, no. <clears throat> it, they're just uh, trying to go more softly because they don't want to interfere, inter interfere, break, yes, interbreak, yes, in intrude, yes. You cannot find the word, yes. Break in, in truth, yes. Yeah, and it's a, uh, um, it's a Sasani. Ha. Huh. Okay. So, if uh, if I may. Yeah, yeah. He said there is a. Uh, he was listening about the eyes that you were saying about eyes of. Yes. Grace and connection of yeah, yeah. What I understood, he said that. Um, um, the connection, it's not that clear that it's, it's most of unknown. Uh -huh. And uh, is there is a, is there is a species like Kral or something like that? I know Grail Grays, but um, I don't know Kral. Grail Grays, I heard about them. There is some gray species. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Prana, do you have anything to discuss on that question? I want to wrap up, but I, want, I felt yeah, sure. that... Sure, you go ahead and wrap up, you know, I mean, go ahead and wrap up, that's, that's, that's fine. 
But if you want anything else, I would. Um, we can continue for a few more minutes. I uh, one quick. I like your questions. Your questions are pretty logical. Sure. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Stephen. Oh, thank you. So, what do you guys think about labeling? Okay, so I just heard you speak about the Lyran language, and this seems to me, when I translate it, like the language of Helios, like any any pers any being from the star Helios would speak the same language. It seems kind of ludicrous. Like Lyra is a star, right? Oh, yeah, Lyra is a star and Lyra is a constellation. Constellation. Yeah. Constellation. So, yeah, yeah. like yes. when we say the Lyran language, I assume there's billions of points of awareness from that star system. Is there one language they call Lyran and then they all have their own? Or is this a specific species and civilization and country and town? Like, you know. Our language differs so much from city to city, continent to continent, nation to nation. So I just wonder when we say the Lyran language, what is it we're talking about? They have differences too. Yeah. Yeah, they they are they are uh, like Jews and gypsies. They lost their home. The home was destroyed and it was spread over the galaxy. So they keep their original language, and then there is a lot of variations of that. But they kind of are they are the first humans in the galaxy, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why Lyran language is kind of as most fundamental language to any humans, including us. Oh, interesting. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Also, they had a history on the Earth, so they have had races on the Earth in our past that we have now discovering. So exactly. there are aspects of their language still remnant in some of our own. Do you know that actually? Do you know that actually the government has the U.S. government has categorized gypsies as aliens? Yes. Oh, which aliens? I I just wonder. Yes, which aliens? <clears throat> it would be interesting to find out. It's because they are not born. They are not born into the, let's say. They are Pleiadian. Mm, oh. Thank you. They are Pleiadian, he said. There is a, a legend in Gypsies, very powerful one, of the earth, of the land of Ramallah, Ramallah or Ramana, mostly Ramallah. Ramana. Ramallah, yeah, Ramallah. Oh. So what is that? Is it a Pleiadian star or something? I don't have the answer for that. I don't know. Maybe Z, if you are connecting. What, 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 I did not hear that clearly. Oh, is uh, so gypsies believe that they come from homeland called Ramana. Did it, is it a star or planet? No. It's a Romania. Romania. Oh. Okay. Romania. Romania. Romani. All right. All right. Uh, I need to wrap up. Time for kids to go to bed. Uh, do you? Does anyone have a blessing for us? Sabrina, we are always <laughs> blessed. Uh, yes. <laughs> blessed with each other. Hello, everyone. How you doing, Max? Hi. Hi. Hi, Max. Stephen. How you doing? Uh, tired, but happy that I had such a nice company for my reading. I'm 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 so thankful that you joined and you discussed in a very meaningful way. Definitely. Enjoy all your company. We can give you a short blessing. Thank you. Would like to. Chua
Namaste. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Have a good night, whoever is in my time zone, and um, have a good rest of the day, whoever is not in my time zone. Good night, Max. Good night. Thanks for the hang. Good night, Max. Max. Much love. Good night. Peace.